We are now recording the program. So if you do not wish to be recorded, please just turn off your camera at this time. I will, there are a few other things that are going on at the public library. There's always lots of things going on at the public library, but we do have several events going on in May and I'll talk about those quickly. You can sign up for any of these programs on our website. Um, the first program is going to, that I'm gonna talk about tonight is uh, a speaker on May 5th. Uh, author Irene Levy Baker is going to be speaking on There's No Place Like Home, fun in the Philadelphia area. And I think we all need a little fun after this year. Um, the next program is the following evening um, on the 6th of May. And it's a resiliency for you presented by New Jersey Hope and Healing. This is mental, mental Health Awareness Month. And this program focuses on helping us cope with the hardships of the pandemic. Then we have a program on May 10th called Your Credit and You, presented by UCEDC. You can learn more about your personal and business credit and credit scores. And the last program is going to be on May 11th, May 11th called The Love Proof, a conversation with author Madeline Henry. And if you wanna know more about these programs, check on our website. We are also having our book sale going on. It's our first book sale after the pandemic. It's going on during our regular business hours. And Saturday uh, has our very, very popular event when you can fill a bag of books for only $5. So it's a great way to stock up for your summer reading. All right, um, questions and answers for tonight's program will be held at the end. Please enter your questions in the chat. The chat is down at the bottom of your screen and I'll be monitoring the chat while Jason does the program. Just a little bit about Jason. He grew up in South Jersey. He's a lifelong Phillies fan. He has a history degree from Westchester University. He currently works for Rutgers University in Camden, and he has a nonfiction book on the way. It's about baseball road trips. It's called Slices of Americana. It's uh, published by Sunbury Press, and it's coming out later this year, so we're definitely excited to find out about that. All right, thank you again, everybody, for joining us tonight. Well, I'll be uh, back with you at, toward the end of the presentation. Have a wonderful, I know it's gonna be a great presentation. Remember, it was a year in the making, so it's, it's gonna be great. All right, everybody, have a wonderful evening with Jason, and it's all yours, Jason. All right, well, well thank you so much, and thank you to the Cherry Hill Library for allowing me to do this presentation. I, I really appreciate it. Um, I'm gonna, normally I do these in person, but since uh, COVID hit, we've kind of been, I've been doing these, um, online. So hopefully everything goes smooth from a technological standpoint. So I'm going to share the screen and um, we'll get started. Hopefully it's a lot of information, but I'm trying to, I'll keep it light and fun. So um, hopefully everybody has a good time and thank you for joining me. And it's nice that um, I'm doing this presentation following a, a big Phillies win this afternoon. So if, um, if you predicted this morning that Mickey Moniak and uh, Knapp were going to be the two guys that came through for the Phillies, um, talk to me uh, later because uh, I probably would want to invest in the stock market on, on your tips if you saw that coming. Um, so we're going to cover basically the, the three ballparks um, from the Phillies and also the athletics history. So we'll kind of get started. This is my uh, info. So afterwards, uh, I'm always open to feedback, good or bad. Uh, there's always ways to improve. So my email address is jason.love at ruckers.edu. And I also have a very simple website. It's just talkingbaseballwithjasonlove.com. It's more of just some baseball photos that I have um, from my trips um, you know, throughout the years. And that's an old picture of myself and my little league team from probably like the early 1980s. So um, I was never very good at baseball, but I've always loved baseball. So we'll get started. So the Phillies basically, just to give a, a very quick overview of the Phillies. Um, they Jason. First, yeah. Jason, I'm so sorry. Apparently, um, we're we're not able to see your screen. So you can't see it. Let me just make sure that I'm giving you the controls. Yeah, you should have the controls to do it. Yeah. Oh, wait, let me see. Thank you to those people. I, I thought I was the only one, so thank you. I oh, know. Okay. Let me try <laughs> Yay, this. Yay, that looks good. <laughs> Sorry about that. Yeah, looks good. <laughs> okay. So there's my info again. Thank you for the heads up on that too. It would have been embarrassing going through the whole presentation without sharing the slides. Um, so my email address is just jason.love at ruckers.edu. And the website is talkingbaseballwithjasonlove.com. 
So just a little thing about the Phillies. Um, so they first played on May 1st, 19, or 1883. And they actually first played at a small ballpark called Recreation Park. And initially the Ru Ruby Red, Red Legs disbanded and the National League wanted a franchise. So they decided Philadelphia was a big enough market. So they relocated the franchise to Philadelphia. And they kind of struggled right out of the gate. Um, their first season, they only won 17 of 98 games in that first season, which is a less than a stellar record. The first owner and founder of the team, his name was Alfred J. Reach. And there's actually a historic marker uh, of him right in Center City. He initially owned a sporting goods store and he saw this as a way to help promote his business. Um, so he basically saw the Phillies as a way to help advertise um, the stuff that he was selling for his sporting goods store. And he actually died in 1928 in Atlantic City at 87 years of age. So there's just a, an old picture of Recreation Park. It was located at 24th Street and Ridge. And it could only seat about 6,500 people. Um, and as you can see, there's a lot of obstructed views from that with the, the poles and things like that. So um, it's not like the ballparks that we're used to today as far as where um, basically have a clear view of the field. And one of the early stars of the, of the team was a guy named Charlie Ferguson. Uh, unfortunately, he died uh, at the age of 25. I believe he died from tuberculosis. So um, he was like their first big player. So. The first basically uh, 20, 30 years, the Phillies kind of struggled. Um, they would not actually make the World Series until 1915. And you can kind of see some by the early photo there, some of the uh, gloves weren't even really the norm. And um, the uniforms didn't have like the fancy logos and things like that that we're accustomed to today. And their first season, they lost the game 28 to nothing. Uh, which is actually one of the, the, the most lopsided game in the history of uh, baseball as far as a shutout goes. And um, that first year, they finished 46 games out of first place. And um, they did improve their second year uh, where they only finished 45 games out of first place, but um, still not exactly uh, much of an improvement. As I mentioned before, their first game was May 1st, 1883. Um, they lost that first game, which would be one of many losses as the Phillies were the, uh, the first professional team to reach 10,000 losses in the history of a ball club. And they lost to a pitcher named Charles Radborn, who actually um, that year would go on to win 59 games himself just as the pitcher. So um, back then they didn't really have the five-man rotation that we're used to today. And that first game, 1,200 people came out to watch the Phillies play. So after Recreation Park, um, they moved to the Baker Bowl, and this was home to the Phillies from 1887 through the middle of the 1938 season. Um, so originally it was built of wood, um, but unfortunately when you build these structures of wood, um, they become fire hazards, and this one burnt down after eight seasons, and they actually moved to a newer ballpark, um, which was reinforced uh, as far as less of a fire hazard, and they moved there in 1895. And their first owner uh, was a man named William F. Baker. He never really had quite the, the money to invest in the team or the ballpark. Um, he was basically just kind of ran the team, but um, he really didn't have the, the means to um, bring in any star players or, or really make it much of a competitive team. Um, he never wired a public address system and he never had like a separate press box for the reporters. And as you can see during the whole uh, decade of the 1920s, uh, the Phillies did not have one uh, winning season. And I should mention too, in the early 1880s too, the Phillies, they're always known as the Phillies, but sometimes they were referred to as the Quakers as well. And just a little bit about the Baker Bowl. Um, it was basically known as what's called like a cigar box uh, due to its small dimensions. It was 340 feet in left, 408 in center. And at right field, it was about just under 280 feet, which is really short for a major league ball club. Um, so it's really tight as far as uh, in that right field. So what they did, as you can see on the, uh, on the photo there, uh, they kind of built up the wall to try to cut down on some of the, the cheap home runs, but it still was really, really a small um, ballpark for a major league team. And 
another interesting thing too, the clubhouse was located behind the center field wall. So in, in today's game, the players kind of emerge, you know, from the back um, of the dugouts and things like that. So here, the clubhouses, they would kind of walk across center field uh, when the game would begin. And um, another interesting thing too, this ballpark never had lights uh, in its history, uh, hosting the Phillies. And just to compare to some of the other ballparks at the time, there was Hilltop Park, which um, was home to the Yankees, although they were referred to initially as the Highlanders. And as you can see the dimensions here, uh, 365 feet in left field, and 542 feet in center, which is just outrageous as far as there's no one's going to come close to, um, not even Bryce Harper's going to hit a home run uh, that far. So as you can kind of see in this picture too, when they had overflow crowds, what they would do is uh, to sell extra tickets, they would invite fans to actually sit on the field and kind of rope them off. So you can kind of see in the outfield, some of the fans just sitting right on the ball field. Um, and center field, right field was even deep too, it was 400 feet. So um, the one thing about baseball, there's, each ballpark is kind of unique in its dimensions. So this ballpark would be considered uh, much larger than the Baker Bowl. And this one closed in 1912. So as I mentioned, uh, they never really invested much money in the Baker Bowl. Was, initially when it was built, it was kind of state of the art, but it quickly fell into disrepair. Uh, in 1903, the right field grandstand collapsed and that killed 12 people and injured over 200 people. And then in 1927, uh, the right field stands collapsed again. Um, and the ownership really just never invested uh, in, in the ballpark. One of the early stars um, in the early 1900s uh, for the Philadelphia Phillies, just to touch upon, that was Grover Cleveland Alexander. Uh, he pitched for the Phillies and later the Cardinals. And he averaged 27 wins per season for the Phillies. And he won 28 games in his rookie year. Um, unfortunately, the Phillies, this was right around 1918, uh, um, the Phillies thought he was going to get drafted into World War I. So they didn't want to just lose him. Uh, and not get anything in return. So even though he became a Hall of Fame pitcher, uh, the Phillies traded him just to get something in his return. And he did eventually serve in World War I. Uh, he came back and he pitched uh, for several more years uh, and he retired with uh, 373 wins. And he's the only guy I know that he was actually named after a president, Rover Cleveland, and later um, future president, uh, Ronald Reagan, uh, played him in the movies uh, in his life story. So um, that's the only ball player I know that has a kind of a tie to two presidents. And he was inducted into the Hall of Fame in 1938. And an incredible thing too, he won more than 30 games six times during his career. So um, you think of the Phillies today, I, I, I'm trying to think off the top of my head, the last time we had a 20 game winner um, probably has to go back to um, Roy Holiday. So, we don't even get that many 20 game winners, let alone 30 game winners uh, these days. Um, this guy's not really a star, but he probably has my favorite baseball name, um, Bud Weiser. He played for the Phillies for two seasons, 1915 and 1916. And um, like I said, not really a great player. Um, hit zero home runs in his career and he batted 162. He eventually just returned back to PA and um, uh, in that cold country and played semi-pro ball. So um, I just threw him in there because I think that's a great baseball name. And um, I was at the game this past Monday and I don't know if it was Bud Weiser, but it was Bud Light, but uh, somehow the fans started doing Eagles chants midway through the game. So um, I think that was more uh, attributed to the Bud Light they were drinking though uh, during the ballpark. Another interesting thing too about the Baker Bowl, um, it kind of, this kind of changed the shape of the, uh, what happens when the ball goes into the stands. So uh, at the time, the, if the ball was hitting to the stands, the usher would come over and the fans would turn it back to the usher and the ball would be thrown back into play. So at this time, an 11 year old kid named Robert Cotter, he caught a foul ball in 1923. And when the ushers asked for it back, he was so excited that he caught a foul ball, he refused and tried to escape with the foul ball. And the Phillies just due to their, um, basically their cheapness and um, cutting corners, they had the kid arrested and he actually spent a night in jail. And uh, at the time, the judge, uh, he ripped him 
uh, the ownership is being cheap instead of really it was possession of the kid uh, since he caught it. And, you know, it, it was not really uh, a souvenir. It was a souvenir he should have kept. And the Phillies got such bad publicity that not only the Phillies, but ball clubs throughout Major League Baseball at, at that time, they started allowing fans to keep the foul balls that went into the stand. So um, even though the Phillies weren't good, uh, they did kind of shape the future of baseball and catching uh, foul balls and home run balls and keeping them as, as souvenirs. And another interesting tip, tidbit uh, with the Baker Bowl, um, again, just to cut corners, rather than pay a landscaping team to maintain the outfield grass, uh, the owners uh, had a couple of goats. Um, they had like a little pen in the outfield. And when the games weren't played, they would have the goats uh, kind of nibble at the grass just to keep it from growing. Um, this lasted for a couple of years, but unfortunately, uh, one of the goats uh, nipped an employee and finally they, uh, they removed them and uh, the goats were, were no more. So, um, but they did actually, that was the way they maintained the outfield grass for uh, a couple of seasons. And as I mentioned too, just with the right field short fence, um, the owner Baker, he actually had the uh, right field wall increased to 60 feet uh, just because so many of the players, his own players were hitting home runs such as Chuck Klein that um, they'd come back the next year and say, you know, hey, we hit so many home runs. Um, how about a bump in salary? So in, a, in an effort to, to suppress the salaries of his own players, um, he increased the wall to 60 feet, which um, just as a point of reference, that's, that's several feet, feet higher than even uh, the Green Monster in, in Fenway Park in Boston. So um, it was uh, really just a, a unique feature uh, of this ball club. And another, just kind of a, another interesting tidbit that happened uh, at the Baker Bowl. So when you think of the Houston Astros and their cheating scandal uh, from a couple of years ago uh, with the banging on the trash cans to tip off their batters, uh, what the Phillies did, this was in the early 1900s, they had like an electro, electric box uh, where the third base coach would stand and they had a wire from the third base box. It was buried in the dirt and the wires would, would run to center field where they had a backup player sitting with um, binoculars. So he would steal the catcher's sign and kind of tap on like a telegraph type of thing. And through the electric current, the third base coach would feel it under his feet. And then he would then relay the message to the uh, player uh, at bat, who then would be tipped off of the pitch. Unfortunately, uh, so the third base coach always had to kind of stand in that same place in order to feel the vibrations under his feet. So at one time, a Reds player just kind of got curious as far as why is the third base coaching in the exact same spot every single play, you know, throughout the game. So between innings, he went over, kind of started digging, and then he found this box, and then he ended up pulling on the cord, and then everybody kind of gathered around. The police came onto the field, um, big commotion, and then the, the wire went right to the center field uh, bleachers where their coach was sitting there with binoculars. So they were kind of caught red handed. Um, you would think with such a, a way to, you know, tip off pitches and things like that, it would help them. Um, but really, it, it really had no benefit. I mean, I had a benefit to the players, but not really much to their win loss record, unfortunately. And the cost of the ballpark, <clears throat> it ranged anywhere from 80,000 to 100,000 to be built. I couldn't get the exact figure. Um, but that was basically the numbers that I found as far as uh, you know, what it cost to build this. And there was a railroad tracks that ran right behind it. And um, one of the big features too was the Life Boy Soap um, advertisement that was in the right field wall. And um, a funny thing happened too, I guess it was in the 1930s when the team was really bad at one point. Um, so basically the, the advertisement said the Phillies used Life Boy Soap. Um, at one point, a, a fan snuck in uh, and graffitied the wall and said, where it says the Phillies used Life Boy soap and he painted on the wall and they still stink. So the Phillies kind of had to scrub that off um, just to, uh, before the next game started. So the Phillies did eventually make it to the World Series in 1915. Um, and this was the first time in the World Series that was attended by a US president, and that was Woodrow Wilson. And that's him standing there about to throw out the ball. 
And just to give a little picture as far as the National League in 1915, it was the Philadelphia Phillies, the Boston Braves, who later would move to Milwaukee and then Atlanta, the Brooklyn Robins, who I believe become the Brooklyn Dodgers, the Chicago Cubs, the Pirates, the Cardinals, and the New York Giants, who later relocated and became the San Francisco Giants, who the Phillies played this afternoon. And the American League was the Boston Red Sox, the Detroit Tigers, the White Sox, Washington Senators, the Yankees, the St. Louis Browns, who eventually relocated to Baltimore and became the Baltimore Orioles, um, the Cleveland Indians, and then the Philadelphia Athletics, who eventually moved to Kansas City for a few years and now are the Oakland Athletics. So in the 1915 World Series, uh, in game one, the Phillies went 3-1. Um, but then the Red Sox uh, sweep the rest of the series, um, winning the World Series in five games. A lot of the games were close. Um, Grover, Cleveland, Alexander won the first game, um, but they just couldn't match the, the, uh, the power of the Boston Red Sox. So games one, two, and five were played at the Baker Bowl. Um, at the time, Shide Park was built, which I'll talk to in a, in a little bit. And they were offered to play there because it was a larger ballpark. However, uh, the owner of the Phillies didn't want to uh, move the, uh, the team, even though they could have sold more tickets, but he didn't want to have to share any of the profit. So that's just the kind of 1915 World Series, like I said. Um, the Philadelphia Athletics were actually the better team at the time. They appeared in the World Series in 1914. Um, but by 1915, Connie Mack sold off um, basically all of his players. So the athletics were not very good uh, in 1915, uh, where they lost 109 games. So it was really a crazy um, drop off where they're in the World Series one year, the next year they go on to lose over 100 games in 1915. So that year, in 1915, the Phillies were the better of the two teams. And another interesting thing in 1915. This was the first year that um, Babe Ruth, he makes his first World Series appearance. At this time, he was known more as a pitcher. He only had one at bat in the series, um, but uh, obviously he'd go on to, to greater fame with the, with the New York Yankees, but he started out as a young pitcher uh, with the Boston Red Sox. And just kind of an interesting footnote, um, after the Yankees, he, held, he hung on for like another year and he actually finished his career with the Boston Braves in the National League. So this allowed, um, basically his final game was played in Philadelphia at the Baker Bowl on May 30th in 1935. Um, but at this point he really kind of knew, uh, he just couldn't do it anymore. And he actually kind of just retired uh, mid season. Um, and the fans kind of knew it at the end of the inning, um, the fans that were in the ballpark kind of stood up and gave him a standing ovation, sensing that um, even Ruth kind of knew that his time was up and this might've been the last time that, that he was ever gonna play a game. And just some quotes as far as about the Baker Bowl. Um, Bucky Walter said, we could sit in this dugout and smell the peanuts in the stand. Um, that's just how close the fans were on, on top of the field. And um, I like this quote. Again, keep in mind the short right field wall. He said, if the right fielder had onions for lunch, uh, the second baseman knew it. That's just because how close they were as far as the second baseman to the right fielder. The Philadelphia Eagles actually played at the Baker Bowl for a couple of years. Um, they first played in, in 1933. Um, unfortunately, they lost just like the Phillies lost in their first game. Um, and they played at the Baker Bowl from 1933 to 1935. A couple of years ago, um, it's Donovan McNabb there, but the, the, the current Philadelphia Eagles actually wore uh, throwback uniforms to kind of commemorate the, uh, the early uniforms uh, back in the day when they were at the Baker Bowl. So um, the Phillies, did, uh, I should say the Eagles had about as much luck as the, at the Baker Bowl as the Phillies did. During the three seasons there, they went nine, 21 and one. Um, a big thing with playing in Philadelphia because of the Sunday blue laws, um, a lot of times you could not play games on Sunday. Uh, Pennsylvania always had these kind of weird laws on the books and Bert Bell, the owner of the Eagles at that time, uh, he petitioned and he obtained the first Sunday license in Pennsylvania so the sport could be played. Um, so more than 17,000 fans came out that day to watch the Eagles play. Um, and over the decades, both the Phillies and the Athletics, they really complained uh, that the blue laws um, cut into their profit margin. And they often complained as far as, uh, you know, that 
with people working so much back then, um, they really wanted to have games on Sunday just because most most of the fans would have been off from work. The Baker Bowl had also hosted the Negro League World Series from 1924 to 1926. Um, the Hilldale Daisies, um, they rented the ballpark throughout the 1920s and 30s. Um, and unfortunately, the Phillies, um, they were one of the last teams in Major League Baseball to bring in a black player. They did not integrate until 1957 with player John Kennedy. Um, that's not him there. That's a, a player from the Philadelphia Stars. But the Phillies, uh, they definitely were one of the last teams to, to integrate. Um, I think they were the last team actually in the National League to, to bring in a black, a black ball player. Just some of the attendance um, over the years. Um, 1895, they brought in 470,000. You can kind of see the years that they were good. 1915, they brought in almost 450,000. But again, you can kind of see the attendance dip. And then by the 1930s, um, the ballpark was a mess and the team wasn't very good. So they only brought over uh, a little over 200,000 fans. And this is just a, shot, a snapshot as far as what the population looked like back then. And as I mentioned, they, they really struggled throughout their early history. Um, they only had one winning season um, between the years of 1918 and 1948. So that's quite a long drought where the, the fans weren't seeing too much uh, winning teams. Um, and again, to just in relations to their um, lack of uh, competitiveness, they usually ranked last in attendance too. And in the last year, they only drew 166,000 fans. Some of the stars at the time, Chuck Klein, he was probably their best player for many years. He spent 15 years with the Phillies um, and he led the National League in home runs three times and he was a career uh, 320 hitter and he was elected to the Baseball Hall of Fame in 1980. Uh, won the NL, uh, National League MVP in 1932. That's a photo of him with Jimmy Fox. And in 1933, he batted 368 with 120 RBIs. And then for whatever reason, the Phillies then trade him to the Cubs, uh, probably just to, to cut uh, costs. So they trade their best player. So their last season opener was in 1938. You can see the marching band marching onto the field. And as I mentioned before, the clubhouse is located back in center field. So you can kind of see that guy standing back there uh, watching the, uh, the band come on. So in the middle of the 1938 season, the Phillies just had enough. So they broke their lease and they moved to Shide Park, which at the time was owned by uh, the Philadelphia Athletics. So they basically um, played in the same stadium or the ballpark as the Philadelphia Athletics uh, moving forward. And after the Phillies left, uh, the ballpark was converted to a midget auto racetrack. And in the winter, they used it as an ice skating rink. Eventually, the ballpark was demolished in 1950. Um, this is a photo I snapped. Um, there's a historic marker there on Broad Street. Um, it's located just north of Temple University. Um, so that just kind of commemorates uh, the ballpark that once stood there. So there's really nothing there now, just a couple like businesses and things like that. And just now shifting gears, um, we'll talk about the, the second uh, ballpark um, in the presentation. So the Philadelphia Athletics were formed in 1901. That's when the new American League was formed. And at the time, a bunch of National League players um, switched um, from the National League and jumped to the American League for higher salaries. And uh, the Philadelphia Athletics uh, were owned by Connie Mack along with Ben Scheid and two sports reporters uh, were the founding owners. So initially, uh, the Athletics played at Columbia Park from 1901 to 1908. Um, but they were actually, unlike the Phillies, right out of the gate um, with Connie Mack's skills and the players they brought on, he was one of the early pioneers kind of, of scouting players and signing, um, kind of finding these diamonds in the rough that, that became great ball players. So they needed a, a larger ballpark to meet their attendance needs um, right from the beginning. And that's Connie Mack too. Everybody kind of knows he's always wearing the suit and the tie and the, and the hat and things like that. So it was located at 21st and Lehigh. Um, the opening day was April 12th, 1909. And somehow 30,000 paid fans um, showed up to the ballpark, although the capacity at the time was about 20,000 people. So 
how all these people squeezed in, I'm not sure, um, but that's how um, they're probably sitting in the aisles and sitting every which way as far as a standing room only crowd. And initially they liked the, uh, the shot, Ben Scheib liked the location because it was close to the trolleys and the land was cheap. So he used what they call straw buyers um, to buy up all the homes in the area from homeowners um, to keep the prices low. And this is just a quote from Richie Ashburn. It had a feeling and a heartbeat and a personality that was all baseball. So it was built for around $300,000 and it was mostly an Irish neighborhood. Um, it was known as Swamp Poodle, um, also known as North Penn or St. Columbus. Um, and by 1912, Connie Mack um, bought out the other two partners. So that left just him and Shive as 50-50 owners. Um, and you can see, as far as this is an early photo, you can kind of see too, like the Baker Bowl, um, you have a lot of ob obstructed views as far as posts and things like that. So depending upon where you're sitting, there's a good chance you're going to have a post um, blocking your view of, of the game being played. And as I mentioned earlier in the uh, slide with the Hilltop Ballpark, when there was uh, an overflow crowd, um, keep in mind, so the owners at this time, their ticket, their revenue, basically, everything came from ticket sales. Obviously, there was no TV, um, radio still in the early days, and um, they didn't really sell any type of uh, merchandise as far as hats or things like that. So everything came from the ticket. So when they could get people in, they kind of squeezed them in wherever they could. So, and as you can kind of see on the right behind the, the, the wall there, and I have a better slide that shows it, but the homeowners across the street, um, they would sell um, tickets to the top of their houses. So the fans would, eventually they set up bleachers so the fans could um, sit up there and watch the game. They kind of made it their own little um, business as far as the way they run things, um, which Connie Mack didn't like basically because that cut into his profit margin. You have the homeowners across the street um, selling tickets uh, to sit on the roofs to watch the game that he's you know, putting out on the field. And that's a kind of a better picture as far as um, what the people did. Um, I'm not sure exactly how safe that is. Um, people are kind of sitting every which way. But they would kind of climb up um, through the house. And a lot of them, um, the families would even sell like hot dogs and, and drinks and things like that. So these fans here are all sitting on uh, the top of the houses. And they're able to actually see the ballparks. They would pay the homeowners. Um, eventually, Connie Mack kind of got frustrated by that. So he built something called Spite Fence. So he upped the fence, um, as you can kind of see in the picture uh, next to the Valentine Beer um, ad, and that cut the view from the, the homes across the street. So basically after that, they weren't able to sell the, um, the bleachers on top of their houses. So it really cut into their little um, cottage industry that they had going on uh, to make a few extra dollars. So uh, the neighborhood referred to that as Spite Fence, but really, uh, Mac did it just to, um, he wanted people in the ballpark paying customers, not across the street uh, paying other people. And if you're at Citizens Bank Park, they kind of gave a little uh, tip of the cap to the rooftop bleachers um, over Ashburn Alley. That was kind of just a, uh, a little remembrance of what, uh, what once was over at Shy Park. And that, that's a better photo on the right as far as uh, all the crowds mingling about. You can kind of see people sit every which way where these people had bleachers um, constructed on top of their homes looking into the, uh, the World Series. With the athletics, like I said, they really break from the start. Um, they, were, they were a pretty good team. They won the World Series in 1910, 1911, 1913. Um, and then they lost in 1914 to the Miracle Braves. And at the time, um, the term $100,000 like a really rich uh, number. So they had the 100,000 infield of Stuffy McGinnis, Eddie Collins, Jack Barry, and Frank Baker. So unfortunately, uh, Connie Mack, um, he basically, when the tickets would go down, or when they actually, I should say, when the athletics got really good, the players demanded higher salaries. Um, and if the tickets weren't there to justify it, um, he wasn't able to pay them. So the athletics, after having such a dynasty from 1910, basically to 1914, 
the players wanted higher salaries, which he couldn't pay. So he had to start selling off his players or they would go elsewhere. So the 1915 athletics finished 43 and 109. And then the 1916 team was one of the worst teams in the history of baseball. They only won 36 games. So, you know, as he's selling off his star players, the attendance starts to drop as well. So after several, several years, as far as um, being a last place team, they kind of, this is known as like the second athletics dynasty. Uh, the 1928 team actually featured eight future Hall of Famers. And um, that's actually Ty Cobb who played, played uh, briefly for the uh, Philadelphia Athletics as well. And in 1928, they finished in second place behind the Yankees. And then in 1929, uh, they come back to the World Series and they defeat the Cubs. That's Jimmy Fox there. He's a future Hall of Famer. Um, and this 29 team is actually considered one of the greatest teams of all time, um, probably right after the 27 New York Yankees. Um, and they returned to the World Series in 1930, um, where they defeat the Cardinals. Uh, the Eagles, they also played at Shide Park, um, and they played there from 1940 to 1957. And they had better luck at Shide Park than they did at the Baker Bowl. Uh, they had a pretty good record of 61, 36, and 6. And they win their first NFL championship at Chive uh, during a blizzard. But the game probably shouldn't have even been played, but they went ahead and played it and they defeated the Chicago Cardinals. And even the players at the time, they weren't sure they weren't going to, you know, they thought the game would be canceled, but uh, the owners went ahead and played the game. And as I mentioned earlier, so the Phillies moved to the Baker Bowl in 1938. So when you think moving forward, once the Phillies were there, sharing the ballpark with the Philadelphia Athletics. So when the Athletics would be away, the Phillies would play there and vice versa. So really um, at Shy Park, um, there was pretty much a baseball game during the summer um, every single day, just between the two teams sharing it. And from the late 1940s, um, as, the Philly, as the Athletics struggle um, was selling off their players and struggling, the, the Phillies actually are the team now that start to rise to the top a little bit. Um, they're a young team, um, you know, known as the Wiz Kids. And Richie Ashburn, he wins Rookie of the Year in 1948. And eventually they make it to the World Series in 1950, but they lose to the New York Yankees. So in the late 1940s, it was really the, uh, the athletics were on the, the downslide and the Phillies were on the upswing uh, with a lot of young talent. And that's Joe DiMaggio celebrating the 1950 World Series. He was their star player at the time. And that's this, uh, a ticket for the 1950 World Series. Um, as you can see, a lower box seat at that time um, cost $8.75. And uh, I know everything's relative as far as money, what, what the, the cost was back then. But um, I think Monday night when I was at the game, that would buy you about three quarters of a beer. I think a current beer goes for about $12 at the ballpark. So. Um, you can see a, a box seat at the World Series for $8.75 so isn't too bad. And during this time at, at Chai Park, um, it's later Chai Park would be renamed Connie Mack Stadium, um, but the best player for the Phillies was probably Richie Ashburn. Um, and also I kind of put this question out there um, between the broadcast booth and what he did on the field. Um, he's probably one of the, if not the, um, one of the most popular Phillies or, or person ever associated with the ball club, just because of the, the length of time between playing there and then um, sitting in the broadcast booth with uh, Harry Callis. So as I mentioned, uh, the athletics are really struggling uh, with funding a, a team. Connie Mack just didn't have the finances anymore to, to run the athletics. Um, so it's, it's 1931 that basically after that World Series win, the Great Depression hits. Connie Mack just didn't have, and Connie Mack too, the athletics was his only source of income. So some of these other owners, obviously they either own like uh, newspaper companies or shipbuilding companies, things like that. So Mack just didn't have the money to, to fund the team. So uh, attendance dips to just over 300,000 in 1954. So they moved to Kansas City uh, that year, uh, following that year. That's just a little thing about Connie Mack. Um, he managed the athletics from 1901 to 1950. Um, 
the one thing with managing that long, when you own the team, when you lose, you know, have 10 straight losing seasons, if you're the owner, you're not really going to fire yourself. So he hung around forever uh, managing the Philadelphia Athletics. As I mentioned, it was uh, 1953. It was renamed Connie Mack Stadium in his honor. Um, and unfortunately, both the Phillies and the Athletics were frustrated with um, basically the, the setup um, of not being able to sell beer at the ballpark and the Sunday Blue Laws. Um, so once the Athletics left, the Phillies bought the stadium for um, 1.675 million. Um, but they, even at that point, um, I believe they were really starting to look for another place to play. They, they weren't too happy. The neighborhood was changing. People were relocating out of that area. And there was just really no parking uh, at this location in North Philadelphia. And I don't want to dwell too on it because it still kind of stings with some Philadelphia Phillies fans, but there was the 1964 Phillies collapse. Um, basically, it was one of the all-time chokes in the history of sports. Um, they were basically in first place the whole season. And they collapsed down the stretch. Um, and there's, they actually even printed the World Series tickets. You can see lower field box for 12 bucks, which um, still isn't that bad um, in 1964. But uh, obviously, they blew it and did not reach the World Series. And the Phillies were looking to move at this time, too, in the 1960s. And actually, at one point, they were really looking at Cherry Hill, where like the racetrack was, um, just because you can see so many people relocating to the suburbs. And they really wanted the place with parking. Um, and also, too, New Jersey um, did not have the restrictive Sunday blue laws as Pennsylvania did. And this just kind of shows, I just kind of put this on there too, as far as it shows the, the population of people leaving the city and moving to the surrounding suburbs. So in 1940, Cherry Hill, had, uh, I don't even think it was Cherry Hill at that time, um, it was 5,800 people. Um, by 1970, the population jumped up to 64,000 people. I think initially at, it was Delaware Township, if, if I'm correct. So eventually they decide on South Philadelphia. In 1967, ground is broken for a stadium in South Philly. Um, you can kind of see the last game at Connie Mack Stadium was October 1st, 1970. And it was just complete mayhem at the end where fans rushed to field. And basically anything, uh, even things that were bolted down, fans just kind of ripped out as far as seats, grass. Um, I saw this one video where they were even taking out like the urinals, piping, uh, grass, you know, bases, anything and everything is a souvenir the fans took. So Shy Park, Connie Mack Stadium saw 62 seasons of baseball. Um, unfortunately, uh, 30 times the Phillies and the Athletics came in last place, um, but there was five World Series champions, um, all with the Athletics. And it's now home to a large evangelical church. Um, but uh, there's, there is a historic marker there. But other than that, there's, there's really no, no remembrances of the ballpark. It's just this huge church that's there. And as I mentioned, there's a lot of lack of parking and other issues. Um, so the Veterans Stadium um, was in the wings. And fortunately, due to weather and things, it was supposed to open in 1970, but it was pushed back to 1971. And eventually, they settled on Veterans Stadium in South Philadelphia. And that's just a great photo I love. If you remember the great Walenda, um, there he is walking the tight road across uh, Veterans Stadium from foul pole to foul pole. It's a great story where after he made this walk, they said he sat down and had like uh, quite a few stiff drinks to calm his nerves after he made the walk. So there's just some early photos. Opening day tickets, you can get the field box seats for $4.25. And to the left there, um, you can see old uh, JFK Stadium and see how tiny the Philadelphia Spectrum looks. And then there's the uh, Veteran Stadium there. But look at all those parking spaces, which really is what people wanted um, to make easy transition in and out um, to the ballpark and not have to worry about driving around looking for a parking space. So the cost was about 45 million, um, capacity of 62,000. And those are the dimensions there. So I mentioned the Houston Astrodome. So at the time, the Astrodome uh, was kind of like the first one of these multi-purpose uh, stadiums where the, the cities wanted or one stadium that could host both football and baseball. 
So the Astrodome was kind of the first, and that was the first one to use like the artificial turf, which made the transition easier between the two sports. Um, so at that time, all these multi-purpose stadiums started to be built. There's RFK Stadium, which is one of those multi-purpose stadiums. I've seen numerous sporting events. Three Rivers Stadium, Riverfront Stadium. You kind of see all these stadiums, really, they all kind of look alike. There's not really much, uh, much difference between them. So at the time, the, the Veteran Stadium, it also hosted the Philadelphia Stars, Temple University, obviously the Philadelphia Eagles, Philadelphia Phillies, musical concerts, um, Army Navy games. So um, the ballparks were never just for baseball anymore for, for many years. So the Veteran Stadium was the first to feature luxury boxes. And technically it wasn't a circle, but it was an octorod, which was kind of an odd shape, but that's the technical term of it. And opening day, the Phillies won four to one. And that was the first year Harry Callis came over. Um, and basically it was great. He was uh, there to open Veteran Stadium and he was there to close it as well. And Larry Boa got the first hit uh, of Veteran Stadium. There was some upgrades over the years. Fountains were uh, added um, between the scoreboards. And then if you remember, Fan Vision was added uh, in the 1980s. And then they did away with those multicolored seats and just went to playing uh, blue seats after the 1994 season. Some of the marketing ideas at the time, uh, my favorite is the Philadelphia Fanatic was brought on um, and he was brought basically to bring in families and, and uh, kids to the ballpark and make it fun. One thing that probably wouldn't fly today, um, Bill Giles at the time was in charge of marketing. He rolled out what was called the Hot Pants Patrol, where you'd have young ladies wearing these shorts to help uh, people um, find their seats at the ballpark. But um, I don't think that would really work in uh, today's day and age. So the Phillies finally won their first World Series, and that was Veteran Stadium in 1980. That's Tug McGraw uh, throwing the final pitch. They defeat the Kansas City Royals. And that was the first World Series played entirely on artificial turf. Um, and that was the first since 1920 where neither team had previously won a championship. So the Phillies, at, uh, during their time at Veterans Stadium, they returned to the World Series again in 1983 and again in 1993. But for the most part, the team struggled throughout the 1990s and the early 2000s. Um, and then as the Phillies get ready to make the transition, uh, to the vet, they signed Jim Tomei, uh, basically to try to generate some interest again in the ball club. And of course, I have to mention Mike Schmidt. I would say he's probably the greatest Phillies player of all time. I can't think of anyone who even really comes close. Three-time NL MVP, 12-time All-Star, 10-time Gold Glove winner. It's over 500 home runs. And the one thing about Veterans Stadium too, it just really had a horrible playing surface. Um, so many football players would get injured as far as blowing out their knees and ankles and things. There was gaps and seams uh, in the turf. Um, and as you can see, that's Andy Reid there is watching as far as um, right before a game. They had to cancel a game, uh, it was a, a preseason game just because of the condition of the turf. So the final Phillies game was played on September 28, 2003. They lost to the Braves. And then the Eagles move across the street to Lincoln Financial Field and the Phillies would move to Citizens Bank Park. And eventually the, the vet was imploded um, in 2004. And at the time Camden Yards opened up and this really kind of set the blueprint for all the ballparks that we see today. They kind of did like a retro ballpark where they made it real open, a baseball only ballpark. They brought back natural grass and they incorporated like the city structures into the, uh, into the the ballpark really so you can kind of it's not really enclosed like all those multi-purpose stadiums and um this really it still holds up today it's really a nice place to see a baseball game so in 1999 both the phillies and the eagles request to replace veteran stadium and the phillies break ground in 2001 they were considering chinatown at one time um, but instead they settled on south philadelphia um, i think again just for more for parking than anything uh the the ease of people getting in and out. And then they moved to their new ballpark, Citizen Bank Ballpark, um, April 3rd, 2004. Well, there are some memories of the vet that live on um, across the street at the parking lot. Um, you, there's home plate and the bases um, as far as where Veterans Stadium once was. Um, you kind of just have to walk around the parking lot though. 
but it is down um, as far as staring at your feet. You'd have to kind of find it, but it is there. They brought the Liberty Bell. If you remember the Liberty Bell that kind of sat up at the top of the Veterans Stadium, that now sits right outside Citizen Bank Park. And then um, some of the old statues too um, are still around from Veterans Stadium. And then too, as far as a lot of the old players, um, at least I guess I grew up going to Veterans Stadium and um, a lot of the old ball players are still in the area. If you go to Citizens Bank Park, um, Greg Lazinski, uh, you know, he sits out there and Bull's barbecue. That's my son getting his photo taken with um, Bull. And a lot of former Phillies too, uh, still make appearances in the area. A lot of the Phillies that played at Veterans Stadium. Um, that's my son with Steve Jeltz. Um, he wasn't the greatest ball player. Um, probably wasn't even a mediocre ball player, but he was one of my favorite players as a kid. So um, he was in the area not too long ago. Um, and my son got a, a picture with Steve Jeltz. So Mickey Morandini is still in the area. Um, a lot of these guys still make appearances, things. If, so if you grew up going to the vet, um, you can still uh, find a lot of these ball players. And I just added to, um, and this is one of the final slides. Um, if you get a chance, Google Tom Garvey's um, secret apartment. This guy actually, he just started making the rounds, but he, um, he worked the parking lots at Veterans Stadium and somehow he got a key to the vet and um, he created his own little secret apartment in the ballpark or in Veteran Stadium, I should say. Um, and he lived there for about two and a half years. And um, it was a concession stand that was closed, but he converted it to his own apartment. So if you get a chance, um, check his story out. He came out with the book um, a couple months ago. Uh, a friend of mine, uh, Kevin, she gave it to me. And uh, it's really a great read and um, definitely worth checking out. I don't know if I would personally with the, the stray cats and things like that, uh, that lived there. But um, it, it's an interesting story to say the least. And just in closing, some books you can check out uh, about some of the ballparks. Pouring Six Beers at a Time, that's a really funny book by Bill Giles. About some of the older ballparks is Lost Ballparks by Lawrence Ritter. And To Everything a Season, uh, that's primarily about Shy Park, but that's a great book as well. And then, um, that last one there, that's just a shameless plug by myself, uh, my book that's coming out uh, later this year, if you'd like to check it out. And I think that's it. Um, so again, um, if you have any feedback or if you think of something or you just wanna reach out, there's my email address, it's jason.love at ruckers.edu. Um, I have a website, I'm not very tech savvy, so I created that website myself. Um, so it's mostly photos and then some other uh, talks that I have coming up but check out Talking Baseball with JasonLove.com. Um, again, it's mostly photos. Um, I drag my son around to all these sites because um, I love baseball history. And um, that's a photo just in closing. Uh, that's my greatest baseball moment. Why I love baseball is the way it connects with um, sons, daughters, you know, parents, grandparents. Um, the only time I ever caught a foul ball was at uh, Camden River Sharks Field. And um, I couldn't believe I caught it. Um, my son couldn't believe I caught it. But I gave it to him and he was really excited. And it's just, uh, even though Camden, uh, the Campbell's Field's no longer there, just like the Baker Bowl, Shy Park and Veteran Stadium is no longer there. You know, I still have the memories of uh, catching the ball and um, he still actually has the ball. So it's just, uh, baseball is just, for me, it's always been a great way to connect with the past and with family and friends and things like that. So um, that's all I have. So I'll open up to questions. Um, thank you everybody for, uh, you know, sitting in on this. I hope you learned a couple things and had some fun and um, go Phillies and um, I'll take some questions. I'm going to stop sharing my screen and thanks again to the Cherry Hill Library for, for letting me do this tonight as well. Thank you very much, Jason. That was a great presentation. I, I really enjoyed it. You have some amazing pictures there. We had a, a couple of great comments, I thought, in the chat. Somebody said how amazing it would have been if the Phillies had actually bought that property in Cherry Hill. We would not yeah. have to go very far to see a Phillies game. So I think all of us were like, man, you know, <laughs> we missed out on that opportunity. Um, a couple of other things. Uh, somebody had a question. Uh, a lot of nice comments in the chat. Let's see, somebody had a question. Um, I'm so sorry. What's your favorite old stadium based on your research? That's a, that's a great question. Thank you, Sonia. Uh, my favorite one, I would say, um, I would probably say Wrigley Field. I think that has a, a lot of character. 
um, and it, it's still in play. So um, Wrigley Field, just the, the personalities involved, the history of the ball club, um, I would say Wrigley Field, although Dodger Stadium would probably be a close second. Um, I'd like to go see Dodger Stadium too, just more for um, just sitting out in the sun, enjoying a beer and some peanuts and, uh, you know, watching the Dodgers play. So I would say those two would be 1A and 1B. A lot of nice compliments in the in the uh, chat over there. That's great, Jason. I had a question. Um, the multi-purpose. Why did why did town or cities go to that idea of a multi-purpose with for baseball and for football? Was it financial? Was it um, and and I guess why did they go away from that concept? Uh, so a lot of it. So in the early days, um, the the owners of the actual ball club funded the, the building of their, of their, you know, field, be it football or baseball. So as it kind of shifted from the 60s and the 70s, uh, these owners of these teams kind of turned to the local cities to help finance the, the construction of the stadiums. So in a way, I guess they kind of cut costs. Um, the cities couldn't really justify, especially when you're cutting funding for like things like schools and art programs and, you know, things like that. Uh, to, to build two stadiums for a football team and a baseball team. So they, uh, they kind of made it these multi-purpose stadiums. Um, and then too, with the invention of kind of AstroTurf, that kind of made it easier to make the transition, um, you know, just switching over basically, you could switch it over almost over a weekend as far as um, adding Eagles play on a Sunday and then the Phillies could come in, you know, to play in September or so to, to play a game during the week. So I would say cost more than anything. And why they went away from it, um, I think really it's just, it wasn't an intimate experience. I remember as a kid sitting in like the six and 700 level at Veterans Stadium and I could, you can barely see like the field of play. So it really wasn't a great fan experience, um, at least from a baseball perspective. And then once Camden Yards came, as far as the success that the Orioles had with building such a nice stadium, fans really kind of gravitated towards that and say like, hey, you know, can we switch gears a little bit? And then a lot of the other, basically just took took their their plan their business plan and 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 went that way so um they kind of switched back to the way it is today i think only the oakland athletics i think off the top of my head still have like a well not even really anymore because i don't think the raiders play any there either so everybody basically has a like a baseball only ballpark that i think of off the top of my head a couple of other questions in the uh, chat. We have time for maybe a couple more. Um, how many stadiums have you been to for and, and observed a game or watched a game? Sure. So um, <clears throat> unfortunately, Major League Baseball, I've only been to a couple. It's more just cost more than anything. I have three kids, so um, they're always hitting me up for money for like iPhones and like uh, God knows what else. So um, I've been to PNC Park, which is really, really nice. I've been to Atlanta, um, obviously uh, Baltimore and Philadelphia. I've been to a lot of minor league ballparks. I find that like a cost-effective way. Uh, I've been to all the minor league ballparks in New Jersey. Um, if you want a really fun time, I would recommend like the Lakewood Blue Claws or the Trenton Thunder too. They both have really nice um, ball clubs. Lakewood's especially nice. My goal is once my kids are older and um, you know I can semi-retire, I'd like to ba basically visit a lot more ballparks. Get to take an RV and go all around the country, right? <laughs> I think that's, right. I hear that from a lot of people. Yeah, um, a couple of things, somebody mentioned that, um, I'm so sorry, I didn't get the name, but the person mentioned that um, there was talk perhaps, oh, I'm sorry, I think it was Irv said, the, um, maybe the vet was going to be put in Northeast Philly on Roosevelt Boulevard. Was that something that you are aware of? Yeah, they were looking at several locations. I'm not sure if Northeast Philly, you know what? I, I believe there was, um, there that was one location, but they just, it was so far off, I think, from what I remember reading for public transportation and things, it just wasn't an easy way to get to. Um, so um, they were looking at a few different locations, but yeah, Northeast Philly was one, but it just, it wasn't uh, feasible. And I saw we had a, a question, an interesting question what, uh, from Ellen. It was, uh, did they have a double home room, double home locker room at Shy Park or did they? Did they have a double home locker room? No, I think, no, so it, usually every team would have its own, the visitors would have their own locker room and then the home team would have their own locker room, just because you're talking strategy and, and, and you know, game prep and things like that. So you don't want the guy that you're pitching, you know, batting to, you know, sitting in the locker room next to you. So they always had separate ones, I, I believe. 
I don't know if anyone wanted to unmute and ask a question. Um, we have like about um, about three minutes left. Does anybody have any predictions for the Phillies this year? I'm hoping uh, they'll, they'll get on a hot streak and hopefully uh, turn things around. I see a friend of mine, I think is that David Fay that's here. So I, I come around, I still think Juan Marichal is a, a good player now. <laughs> that's He's a, going off his shirt. <laughs> <laughs> Somebody has a Phillies, Phillies background. Oh, nice. I like that. Uh, Oh, you guys can't unmute? Hmm, I don't know why. All right, you know, uh, my colleague may have set it up, um, so I apologize. Can you use the chat? I'm so sorry. I don't think I can unmute you guys. Uh, story of uh, Kite Man. Kite yeah, Man, so and that's probably a, about our last question, okay? Yeah, that's, so that's a great one, Man. too. So um, Bill Giles, one of his great ideas was to have a guy on a, a giant kite in the outfield of Veterans Stadium, like 700 level on roller skates, come down on the ramp and kind of fly down and deliver the first ball, uh, you know, at, at Veterans Stadium. But uh, I don't believe he was ever quite successful. I know that they tried it a couple of times. I think the first time he, he kind of just crashed and never even made it um, up over the ramp. I think this, they tried it again a second and a third time. Um, but uh, that was just one of those crazy stunts that the Phillies came up with um, that uh, makes for a great story, but I don't think they have was ever quite successful. They did all cra crazy things as far as shooting people out of cannons and uh, just a whole bunch <laughs> of stuff to generate uh, interest. But Kite Man's definitely up there as far as, uh, as, far as stunts go. Okay, I will squeeze in one more from, I believe it's John. Uh, when do you think your book is coming out? We'll get you, we'll let you have one more shameless plug here. <laughs> well, thank you. <laughs> And I'm hoping by the summer, it's in like editing phase now. I had to send over a bunch of photos. So basically the, the book is, um, my son and I, we went to like Cooperstown, the Babe Ruth Museum in Baltimore. We visited several other um, like historic baseball sites. Um, and I just kind of write about, um, you know, our relationship to the game and to these historic sites and things like that. So um, hopefully by the summer, um, the, the publisher will release it while, you know, while baseball still being played. So. Um, you know, thanks for asking that question. I appreciate it. And I want to say too, just um, oh, thanks everybody. Sure, thank you for everybody for, for joining me tonight too. So I, I really do appreciate it. Hopefully, you know, we can do this in the future where we're in person and then afterwards, you know, have like a, a conversation. So as you can see right from the start, I'm starting talking and like, I'm not even sharing my screen. So it's just like, uh, you know, I'm still trying to get the hang of it, but um, I, I hope everybody enjoyed it. And um, I really do appreciate it. And, and thank you to the Cherry Hill Library as well for. Uh, for giving me the chance to do this. Okay. Uh, well, thank you again, everybody, for joining us. I hope you enjoyed it. I know I did. And uh, have a good night and be safe. And we look forward to seeing you at another presentation. And hopefully we'll get Jason back here real soon, OK? <laughs> thank you. Bye-bye.